ready to go. So good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Fanuel Mwindi. I'm the uh, founding resident here at SAI. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's seminar um, with Dr. Anna Scope from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. So before we get started, um, just wanna tell you a little bit about how these work. These are fairly informal. Um, uh, we bring in these uh, speakers who engage with us uh, with a short presentation and then um, people can interrupt, ask uh, questions. We have people live streaming as well. Welcome to you. Please drop your questions in the chat. We'll try to get those questions to Dr. Scope. Um, but fairly informal, conversational. And so that's what um, I'm really excited to, to welcome today, to, uh, Dr. Scope. So just a quick introduction. Dr. Scope is a professor in the Department of Genetics and also an affiliate faculty member in the Life Sciences Communication and the Division of Arts uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I was really lucky that when I emailed her, I didn't think she was gonna respond anytime soon. I looked at her schedule and I'm like, there's no way, there's just no way, but she did. And I'm so thankful uh, for her for doing that. She mentors both scientists and art students in her lab and also serves as a board at the Wisconsin Science Museum where many of our art science collaborations are on display. In 2008, she was named the Remarkable Women in Science from the AAAS. In 2015, she was honored as a Cavalry Fellow from the National Academy of Sciences. And in, uh, in 2018, she was awarded the first ever, first ever Inclusive Excellence Award by the ASCB, uh, whom we have received funding from, and the HHMI as well. In 2019, she was awarded uh, the honor to serve as the AAAS If Then Ambassador. Check that out, If Then Ambassador, a great program for women in STEM. Her science and art have been featured by Apple, the scientists, USA Today, Smithsonian. I mean, the list keeps going, okay? On a personal side, one of our great hobbies is cooking and baking, uh, including scientific cakes. Hmm, very tasty, perhaps. And she manages a food blog foodscope.com check it out in her social media sites at foodscope in her free time dr scope it's a pleasure to welcome you to sai yeah well thank you for having me it's just an honor to be here and be part of this amazing program and meet all of you um so i'm going to tell you a little story about my life it's a different kind of science talk if you've ever seen one it's this is something you obviously don't hear from a lot of scientists but I started talking about this about in 2014 and it's been snowballing and so it's been kind of fun and this is very interactive and near the near the near near the end maybe two-thirds in I'm going to kind of quiz you and so I want you to interact turn on your camera and do those kinds of things so the title of my talk is called too, too creative for science there's actually it's supposed to be a question mark after this this was actually said to me when I was a second year grad student and I'm going to tell you the story um about before that was said and then after that was said. And I'll tell you what I did with the statement. Um, so I'm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and my kind of outline of my talk is to try to go over who, who I am as a scientist and how I do my outreach and public engagements and how this makes me me, right? So I know that you're trying to learn to do these things. So I'm gonna talk about my family, this being too creative idea, science, a little bit of science is art. Because I'm a geneticist, um, probably the first thing I need to tell you is my genetics. I think that's really important. And uh, you've probably all seen these before, but you know what a pedigree is, right? So I will show you my pedigree. So um, I am the daughter of two amazing artists. My dad was a sculptor and a medical illustrator. and he taught anatomy to medical students. So uh, this is kind of an odd thing for you, but an artist was teaching anatomy to medical students. This was my dad. I didn't know any different, but my dad was kind of talented in that part. Um, my dad is of Ukrainian descent and my mom was his grad student, was a ceramist and an art educator. Here's my mom. I found this recently, my mom um, and me in 1972. My mom is of Lebanese descent and also Eastern Band Cherokee, my grandmother was. Um, they gave birth to four kids, and, and here I am as the oldest here. Um, if you know any stitch of genetics, the first thought that you might see is, oh my gosh, Anna inherited the recessive gene for science. So, <laughs> but that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is that we all inherited an obsessive amount of creativity because art and science involve those things. 
And so people always ask me, how did you grow up in this uh, totally opposite of household? Well, my dad and mom both really love science. Um, my sister, it, these two sisters live in California. Uh, they, she worked for the hair uh, shampoo business. So she worked for Paul Mitchell, the tea tree line. She did the package design for that. So she does package design for shampoos. My sister is a vice president, um, kind of works doing marketing uh, and advertising for kind of Unilever. And uh, she's working on an Anheuser-Busch thing. So things that you see, uh, my family does a lot of things you probably see in your products. And my brother's an industrial designer. If you don't know what that is, um, basically your iPhone, the design of this is an industrial design. So my brother um, does a lot like uh, if you walk into, I, I don't know if you have CVS where you are or any kind of drugstore, those plastic moldings and displays that you see that you're kind of go, oh, I want to buy that product. That's what my brother does. So every part of your life, my family has probably touched. And here I am, the lowly science here, scientist here. And I would tell you that I make, you know, everyone tells you, oh, you get, you become a doctor, you make a lot of money, right? But um, my family are a bunch of artists and they, they make way more money than... <laughs> <laughs> they may way, way more money than I do. Um, and a lot of people also say, I always like to give this joke out to students of why I might have ended up with science. My dad's name, official name is Microscope. So, but he was born Michael Scope and his high school biology teacher gave him the middle name Row. And so my dad on his drawings would draw a little microscope at the bottom. And so it's just my joke. It's a little fun fact about Anna. My dad's name is Microscope. I ended up a cell biologist and a microscopist. So it's kind of like, I always have my father with me, right, in my life. And if you know anything about Zeiss microscopes, they spell the scope the same way I do. So I'm kind of everywhere. So it's kind of like, I kind of was destined to become a cell biologist. Um, here is my home life. So this was my father doing a bust of his football coach. Another odd dichotomy of things that you might think. My dad played football for Syracuse. He went to the Orange Bowl. He played for... He blocked for Jim Brown. My dad was drafted to the Steelers. Again, this is something you wouldn't expect, right? Um, his coach was named Ben Schwartzwalder, who is in the Football Hall of Fame, and Coach Ernie Davis is a Heisman Trophy winner. So this, these are the kind of interesting things that artists would experience, right? But this is my home. But if you are a scientist, right, and you look around here, nothing about this is sterile. It is dirty as heck, right? My, my mom would always, this was always a band but this is sort of adjacent to our home, but this was my unsterile environment, right? And I ended up a scientist, So I, but I didn't know what it was like at all to be a scientist. I knew this life, certainly. My mom was a ceramicist, but also a painter. It was one of my favorite um, pieces of art she did in the, in the late 60s, right around the time she met my father. Um, she's also a ceramist, and, and then, but she can do fabric painting, a lot of stuff. She's a very talented person taught high school for many years. Here's my mother here. This is me at two years old. So we had an art school at my home called Studio 70. And people came from all over the world to study with my father. He, he, was, one, he was one of two uh, Zen masters in the US as well. So he teaches philosophy of art, but people came to my father kind of like a guru. He, was, he used to teach on the East Coast and then we had this studio at our home. People that are here are actresses. They own galleries in LA. They're chairs of art department. She's a chair of a ceramics department. And a lot of them are artists on the East Coast. I just thought these were my brothers and sisters, right? This is like a total hippieville, but I, I just, this is what I knew, right? I grew up with a bunch of college kids in my house. So it was very, I kind of got, I grew up kind of really fast because I just, this is what I knew. And they were very interesting people that were really interested in philosophy of art and design and all of those things. Um, from the beauty of the interwebs, I found someone found a picture of me in 1975. I love this photo. It was my dad's favorite chair. You can see it's a total mess. But this, this documents the last time Anna was very serious. So if you know, <laughs> I'm not like this at all. I'm not very serious because then I realized in 1976, another, another, another picture kind of came around. This was kind of me. I kind of kept kind of getting crazier and crazier. Again, here's my sisters now. My other sister, Zesha, was uh, just born, and my father. And, and, the, and there's my mother here. And again, these are remarkable photos, right, uh, of this era of having these amazing people in my life. You'll kind of see the same people kind of show up. She's an actress now. 
they, a lot of people stayed for many, many years studying with my father. So five, six, eight years. Um, and then went on, you know, upon about their life. And this is in, in the front yard of our home. This is the house I grew up in. So this is the Julian Bechtold house. It, we moved from Connecticut. So I was born in New Haven. We moved to Connecticut to this house uh, that was owned by an artist in the, in the Cincinnati area called Julian Bechtold. You might look at this and go, oh my gosh, Anna's really wealthy, grew up in this very wealthy home. So we won this home. Uh, my dad answered an ad in the paper. There was, the artist was dying and he wanted an other artist who knew how to fix things to take over this house with a studio. My dad's mentor, this is the power of mentorship and networking. And back then there was only newspapers, right? So they saw a newspaper ad and my dad's mentor says, and my dad grew up with a single parent home in the depression and didn't have much, he got a full ride to school. So everything about my dad's life was kind of doing a hustle. You would always kind of find things. So my dad applied to this. We kind of won this home and got this and moved from Connecticut to Kentucky. We kind of went between and my dad built a studio on the side of this home. It's a, a historic home. It's kind of in the English Tudor. It was built in 1923, very run down. I kind of use that, but th there was something very historic that happened in this home. This artist is actually the artist who carved the ivory soap bar. So Procter & Gamble is in Cincinnati. <laughs> this was carved in a giant block in my home. Julian Bechtold worked with, worked with Procter & Gamble as an artist to package the chemistry of soap, right? So I knew very young that art and science had to go together. But as I left my house and went to education, this was totally separate, right? It was kind of strange. But my dad said, you know, you have to put lye and you put fragrances and soap and all this stuff. And you have to, the, the only way to package it, you have to have an artist come in and design it, right? So I knew this and my dad worked in package design for other companies. And so this is, it, it's just kind of a fun fact of some things that happened in this home, but this remarkable life that I kind of, my dad took a, just a chance in doing this. And we ended up living in this really cool place um, uh, and then fixed it up over, you know, I mean, most of my life was fixing this house because it was kind of run down, but that's kind of kind of a cool fact about um, art and science were really part of my life growing up and the ivory soap bar in here. So this is the back of the house. My dad kind of would fix it up. He would learn, he, he made this rose garden for my mother and she would put roses and herbs and there would be sculptures of my father's in the back. Um, and he would put, there's these little step stones that actually had a quote. So when I left this environment and went to college, he took me to the backyard and he, he brought me to this one stone and he said, I want you to read this. And this is what it said. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain one when you grow up, right? Most of you knew how to draw. You do how to do that. The second you hit the education system, you're told that you have to separate this from your life, right? But what my dad was telling me here is don't forget who you are. Don't forget where you come from. Don't check that at the door, right? I understood that much later. I knew what he was saying at that time because I knew I was going into a different world than this life, right? I knew that, he knew that, and he made sure I knew that. So I took that with in mind and I went to school and I found this picture of a picture of a long road in Norway. I think this road can describe anyone's life, right? A long and windy road, most of you students would say yes. Very treacherous, in fact, if it was snowing, it would be even worse. So what did I do? I left home. I went to Syracuse University. I got my dad played football for there. Um, so I went to Syracuse and I majored in biology. I minored in ceramics. Um, after four years there, I, I ended up, I was a work study student, low income student. I went, I worked in a C. Elegans lab. I got really excited about it. I also did my art at the same time. Um, but I got my professors there. A lot of them had been to Madison. And so I applied to Madison. I ended up in graduate school where I am today. I'm going to tell you a story about what happened here. That's why it's right at the river break, this sort of treacherous area of my life. Um, and I ended up going to Berkeley as a postdoc and I came back as faculty. So I'm gonna kind of, this is sort of like my path. This was a difficult time in my life. Lots of them were <laughs> difficult time in my life, but I'll tell you this one. So I, I left, um, uh, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go back to my title of my talk. So now I'm, we're back to the two creative for, for science, you know, title. This is a question mark. 
I told you what, that a mentor said this to me. So how do you think I feel now after I told you my personal story now? What, what do you think? I want you to answer. What, what, what is the first thing that comes to your mind now that you know a little bit about who I am? Amanda, do you have an idea? Um, maybe very confused that these things should be separated when they shouldn't. Yeah, right. But, but confused upset, unsure of the PhD program that I was in, certainly. And sometimes a one-off sentence can really destroy a student. So when you're very conscious about what you say to people, you do not know what's on the other side of that person, right? You don't know who they are, right? So my dad said to me, my dad said to me, um, and I called my dad this before cell phones, and I said this was said, and, and my I, my dad was a very funny guy to try to be, he was a great mentor in that way and father and would always kind of, he says, listen, there's two assholes on every campus and you found one, right? He would say something funny like this because he was trying to tell me that not everyone's going to be like that when you encounter in life, but that you will find people that you have to deal with that say things and you have to learn how to respond to that, right? So my dad says, let's go to the library. I want you to go find scientists who are creative. First one pops in your head, probably this person, right? Da Vinci. My dad goes, let's talk about Da Vinci. So I'd find old text. I would call him on the phone and we would talk about it. And he told me the life of Da Vinci also was difficult, but look what he did. You know, he, he invented the helicopter back then. He was drawing this anatomy, amazing things that were happening. And so back then my dad realized, you know, he said scientists were always artists. It, they changed at the turn of the century, right? Like this break in modern education changed, but you're, you're not alone because they're, they're there. And my dad knew of, of other scientists certainly, but then I ended up finding a lot of people my dad had never heard of. And I want to share some of those people with you. Um, these, this is a picture of fungi. So I, um, you may know who this is. If you know who this is, is this is Ernst Haeckel. Um, he does a lot of diatoms and plants and mushrooms. So I discovered him amazingly. He looks like my father a lot. Um, and I was like, Ooh, it's a friendly face. Um, but Ernst Haeckel, it, he's connected to Darwin because he's actually the science communicator for Darwin. He was the guy who drew, uh, embryos that came from different mammalian species to show people that evolution actually exists because they're very similar. You probably know this story. I should put this in my talk, but that's that's what he's famous for. So they had to, that was done in newspapers, right? Darwin went, you know, went to Galapagos, came back, and then Ernst Haeckel would write about this. And he said, this does exist. You know, evolution does exist. And so SciComm has been happening for a really long time here. <laughs> Communicating science is just kind of, it got lost. The other person I discovered is Ramona Cajal. You probably know Cajal, the, this famous Purkinje cells. He, he had a traveling art show many years ago. I went to New York City. to I flew to go see the show. Um, his father, you know, he painted and, and did a lot of, you know, a lot of paintings and drawings. But his father said, you, this is not good. You're, you need to go to medical school. So he did, certainly. But the, the, the observation skills of the neurons that he did were really key to those success. So you can see I'm kind of weaving in there, but as a woman in science, I never really knew about history of women in science. It was very hard, but the, obviously the first person I probably found is this woman, Rosalind Franklin, as someone who's in genetics. This is her, her um, the remarkable X-ray diffraction image. But if you know anything about history, the onset, the, the fact that she took this picture was the advent of photography that was happening at right so, i mean it happened many years before this but photography and science were coming together and you can snapshots of things right so art and science are really important for this and it dawned on me that visualization is really important for discovery right and so this is my i was like oh okay you know that makes sense and if it wasn't for this image and for the advent and discovery of photography and how you would do that these two guys couldn't have built the dna sculpture so this is a sculpture and a lot of these armatures that are holding these sculptures, they're used in art, right? And so we call them models in science, but they're actually sculptures, right? So throughout this look of after my mentor, my first mentor said, you're too creative, I realized I kind of belong here and my dad kind of helped me get back in the mindset that I would, I would be there uh, in science. 
And because I told you I like quotes, um, one of the quotes that drives me over the years, I found this quote from a psychologist at Berkeley, Alison Gopnik says, scientists are actually the few people who as adults have protected time when they explore and play and figure out what the world is like, right? Scientists are simply big children. And I realized, hey, I'm kind of a big kid and fun and science is kind of fun. I kind of belong here, right? So, so that's actually how I view science. It is a really fun endeavor. You're, prob you're a creative problem solver. I mean, that's what an artist is too, same kind of thing. Um, so what else happened in graduate school that really defined who I am? Um, I failed my prelim twice. So you, all of you have taken your prelim. I don't know if you've done that yet. I failed twice. I'm still here today, obviously. But what happened after I failed twice? So I, I told you, I, I don't know if I, you all have heard, I'm dyslexic. Test taking is very hard for me in class. I can do everything else wise. But I had this amazing mentor named John White. And if you don't know who he is, he's actually um, the inventor of this confocal microscope. And he, told, he turned to me one day, the laser scanning confocal microscope. He actually fortuitously ended up in Madison at that time. He turned to me and said, after my prelim exam and said this statement that transformed me, uh, he said, I got a D in math, but I invented this microscope, <laughs> right? So I looked at him and I said, you, John White, uh, has a D, a D in math and you did this? He goes, yeah, school doesn't really matter. You know, these things kind of thing. It does, but you kind of have to, you know, you kind of have to work hard to be passionate about it. He's also the person who is the only person in this world who's mapped the entire nervous system in an organism. So he mapped the entire nervous system of C. elegans. So, um, and he's, he it was in the lab of Sidney Brenner, won the Nobel Prize. And so many people think he should have won the Nobel Prize as well with the other, the other two in, in the, um, who won for C. elegans there and, and lineaging the C. elegans embryo. So that mentor, this is the new lab that I'm in now, really changed my mind. And within six months of joining his lab, I had a paper. This is about environment and, and being in the right place and right time. He also loved art. He loved that I can see things differently than other people. He had a keen sensibility about who each person was in the lab. And so those are the kind of things when you're struggling in school, sometimes it's really a mentor change. It's kind of a fit thing. So for me, it was really a fit thing. But what else happened in grad school? So I discovered, um, an undergrad too, I discovered I hated these things called gels. Um, I, I mean, most people knows what this is in this group, but I looked at this and I kind of looked around, I was like, is this really biology? Like I feel still, I look at this and I can't figure it out. I was like, I don't really know what this is. <laughs> it's so weird and esoteric. It's bizarre. I know some people use it as art in their house, right? So that's fine. I could care less about this technology. It just really doesn't, it's so hard for a dyslexic to figure out because there's more, there's too much for me to see. So, I mean, I understand it now, but it's just kind of weird. But I ended up in John's lab with this microscope. And so this is what I love. I love live dynamic embryos. And you could see, I told you my story of my growing up. I love this because it's beautiful. It's amazing. And it, what hits you, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So you're looking at just after the sperm and egg meet in the C. elegans embryo, and this is the mitotic spindle, and it's dividing here. Um, one of my first movies in graduate school on the multi-photon, so not just confocal, but it was a multi-photon. Years later, it dawned on me why I love this, why I love what I work on. Well, it's because my favorite artist is Moreau, the so Spanish artist Moreau. You can kind of see mitotic spindles and the big nucleus here. Moreau never really saw much biology, but if you look at any of his work, it's very biological. You have little vesicles here and, you know, it's very fantasy biology to me. And I love Moreau. I've been to the Moreau Museum in Barcelona. Every time I go there, I just, I love just the playfulness of it. I love the science side of it. It just really speaks to my soul in a lot of ways. And that's kind of why I like the science I do. So you kind of know it's a good fit. So I still work on mitosis. It's firstly because it's beautiful, but it's a really important process. And you know that failures in this causes cancer. What you might not appreciate it also, failures are happening in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. So I am studying the, the, um, the structure. It's a, called the new organelle. After I worked on it, it's called the midbody. I don't know if people heard about the midbody, but I'm kind of the midbody girl. This is what I work on. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm giving a talk at Harvard on the third about my science. So you're welcome to come to that. I know that's all virtual, um, but I'm not going to talk about that too much. But so 
there are a lot of things I'm proud of about my career. I am certainly very proud as someone who likes art. I got the cover of science. Um, it's part of my job, but I I got super excited by, about this. You can care less once your paper's out, you're kind of done with it, right? <laughs> but you kind of, it's kind of exciting to get the cover. So this also was used in a lot of promotion for science journal. So they blew it up really big. It was kind of fun. People were seeing it in airports. So that actually made it even more fun um, to kind of get to this level, but I'm honored to be in that journal. The other things I'm proud of, I am in the laboratory of genetics at UW-Madison. The reason why I'm proud of it is, is kind of an ironic thing is because in 1994, I was rejected from this department. <laughs> Why? Because my GRE scores were, were so low. And of course, you know, GRE, so I would have been, I was lost to this department, but I was accepted into the cell and molecular biology department at Madison. I still came, but I, I was rejected from the own faculty that took me in, in 2004 as faculty. I became associate and then a full professor. So this irony is not lost on me, but I do understand I've been a strong proponent of getting rid of the GRE scores. Um, and trying to, to do this for, for my own reason is because I was lost to a lot of programs because I didn't fit the mold of, of really what a scientist should be. And I, you know, some of the colleagues that were involved in, in not allowing me now allowed me to be full. So this is the thing in science, you're not going to get into everything that you are. It doesn't mean you're not smart enough. It just, for whatever reason, there's something that get, but you can kind of show them up and tell, you can come back and say, you're kind of, you're always amazing and you're going to show them up. So I, this, I, I like sharing that for that reason. And one of the reasons I like sharing it with people is also really what your life and your career in science is about is this, is persistence, right? And so you don't, you're not, I'm not you shouldn't be judged by the, you know, the cover of science, but really how many times I, I fell down and got back up. And you're going to do that often in your life and your outreach programs, your work, your, all of these things, you're, there are things in your life that's really going to hit you hard, but you have to, if you really love it, you just have to pick yourself up. You know, I failed my prelim twice. I did all these, these things have just been impediments in my life. Um, but I got back up and I'm still here and I still struggle. I just, just my own personal thing. I still struggle at these things. So, so I want to switch gears and talk about my outreach program. So that's my kind of career and my path. And so as a grad student, I started on this idea of science as art because you, I, you've seen my life now. I grew up doing art shows. I had this family like this, but I came to images like this and going, wow, these are amazing. Why doesn't the public see this, right? And I did art shows with my parents. I'm like, this is kind of easy. I'll just <laughs> kind of do it. But I started actually doing in kind of 1996, 95, doing logos for the C. Elgin's meeting. So I don't know if any of you are C. Elgin's people, I've been in Worms for almost 30 years, but I started doing this. I've never paid to go to a meeting because I do the logos and all these in the art show. So I started doing this at the meetings um, and it made me think about things outside the thing of how do I kind of attract or kind of represent our, our community here. So I started doing that. And then in 97, I asked my mentor, could I do a worm art show, right? And I went to him, I think I was a third year in grad school. And John White says to me, he goes, you can do whatever you want, but just don't include me. He's kind of too busy. Um, but so um, my postdoc in my lab said to me, you're making a big mistake. You're going to, you're going to, your career is going to be over if you do this. Right. But guess what happens? It's an ongoing event for 24 years and it's got a lot of press and the science and, you know, scientists um, and also public. And in 2019, when Nobel laureate Sidney Brenner, who started C. Elegance, I made it to those articles with Sydney Brenner because I made the community amazing. Sydney certainly did, but the art show was really a huge part of this community building. And so I didn't know, that wasn't my idea going into this, but the idea that everyone came in and did, you know, submitted their artwork is a community building event, right? It creates a different side of science. And so I was very honored to be part of that and do that. The amazing thing, my very first show in 97, my own mentor who told me he didn't have any time submitted his own art piece to this event. He had reconstructed the C. elegans vulva in wood and painted every cell. And he kind of did this and it was kind of amazing. So it was kind of those things of some people tell you, you know, they're too busy for something, but it's kind of like pretty cool that, you know, he even submitted himself. So I'll show you a couple pieces of artwork from this. So Abby Dernberg, good friend of mine, 
This is your most beautiful gonad you've probably ever seen, C. elegans gonad. Abby, Abby, lots of people who submit this, I will tell you all the rest of the slides, everyone has become a faculty member here. She's my first, one of my first winners, but also my first Hughes investigator. So now there's a joke in the C. elegans community, if you don't enter the art show, there's likely very low things that you might be, you know, recruited as a faculty. So it's just a sign of creativity. It's kind of a joke, but it's just kind of this funny thing. Almost everyone I show you became a faculty, but they're entering very young. So all along the line, they're kind of being marketed and people really like them. So it's a really way to get on the stage in our community and do this. So here's um, worms having sex on a boutique scarf. So there are things, people doing amazing things in their free time, right? And kind of doing, Arena, Arena is in Paris, I think. Um, see, people take their EM images and make kind of an Andy wormhole thing. This is a lot of humor in a lot of these things, right? Um, here's a newer one, this, this lovely watercolor from Dr. Varsha Sting. So a lot of professors enter this as well. This is just to describe olfaction of C. elegance. It's really re amazing. So this really international and art inspired by their own culture, which is a really part of things that we like to elevate in our, in our um, society and group. I do this too. So this is my this is my take on the actual Moreau painting you've probably seen. And this is the worm version of this with the embryo development here. So I kind of do, I always enter that. The other thing that I do is also have a theme every year. And I I always look at what's happening. And so in 2019, I thought, why don't we do kind of a Banksy thing? Could we have model organisms? Um, in, in with graffiti. So we got a lot of submissions, but this was our grand prize winner. This was actually in Vienna. So Philippe just became a PhD this year. This was on a wall in Vienna in this kind of like um, graffiti park. Of course, it's been color over, but I'd never, I just was astounded this went viral. Um, and it ended up launching Philippe's secondary career of doing graffiti of model organisms in big science institutes. So the, the art show does launch a lot of new up and coming science artists. So Beata Mirzwa is another one who does mitosis on lots of clothing. She does clothing, fashion design, she's a warm person. So a lot of these things are being launched from this competition, um, which it's, it's just awesome to see that I think in the end for me as someone who felt really alone in my life of being in this art side is that I see that there's other people like me, but also important that this is really public engagement. So, so what I'm doing is like engaging with the public and we're getting people to see what C. elegans is about and the genetics and all of these things. And that science is actually really fun. So when I became a faculty member, I started doing a lot more things. I didn't realize how much more opportunities I would get. But when I came to my building, um, there was a total empty wall. And I was like, I can't work here because it, this massive empty wall, I was in this new wing of this new biotech center. And so I went up to the Dean and I gave him my idea. I have all this experience in this art show. And he gave me 15,000 in cash. I didn't write a grant. This was amazing. I went without asking my chair and I did this. And so I took images and blew them up massively and we now have busloads of kids. This installation got me in the art department and then got me a lot more opportunities with art students. So busloads of kids come through here to do our, we have an outreach program in our building on the first floor, but now I can walk in here every day and be very happy to work there because I have things on the wall. But more importantly, it just it makes the space a little more interesting and shows off the science that's going on there. And I wanted to show off all the model organism science of, of things that are here. This led to the, so the art department and the chancellor saw this installation and the chancellor gave us $8,000 to do this um, show in the Madison airport. So this was a collaboration between science artists. They printed it on sort of high quality uh, paper and we framed it. It was the most popular show they've ever done in the airport. They were, uh, there was a kind of a comment box overflowing with comments from people coming through. I didn't never knew what a stem cell looked like. I didn't know that zebrafish embryos are so beautiful. You know, lots of things. It was really, I actually sat there for hours watching people interact and sometimes they would ask me, but it was kind of really cool. This launched a whole bunch of news, especially for the UW campus. We were on NPR and PBS and the Tribune. So a lot of things kind of happened from this. Um, and then this show came, this other competition that we work on is Cool Science Image Competition. But now I want you to 
Now I want you to shout out what you think this is. You might know what it is, but I'm gonna give you a chance to tell me what this is. Anyone knows what this is? You must know what this is. Looks like a Drosophila embryo to me. Yep, Drosophila embryo, you're sure. Yeah, very sure. So these are the stripes of gene expression in the embryo. But this is a really good public engagement piece for many reasons. It looks like an Easter egg. So this was on the front co cover of the New York Times during Easter for this reason. So it's a great public engager. So there's kind of this thing that I'll show you what is really, what public really, how do you get the public to interface with your science? You have to show them a known and then there's an unknown there. It's kind of hidden, right? Um, how about this? Anyone know what this is? They would go. They would go hiking and get attacked by a plant. You get you rut, brush up against a leaf. So this is this is from a Arabidopsis. It's from the other side of the leaf. It's called a trichome. It's something that does. It's involved in respiration too, but it fends off kind of bugs eating the plant. So it's on. The, it's that really fuzzy part of the underneath of the leaf, right? But this looks like something from space, right? So most people go, kind of looks like it's on the moon. It's really engaging. It's really interesting. And it's very, very small, but it's on something very harmless, like the mustard plant, right? So it's kind of cool. I love this. And I, when I saw this, I was like, whoa, it's just absolute perfection in imaging. We now led from the tiny to this cool science image competition, which is a collaboration between Promega, the biotech company, which is in Madison, the art department of which I'm in. And I'm also part of this, I Research Institute, McPherson, um, UW, who houses a lot of these cool science Im images down at the hospital here. Um, and so these are some just samples of some of the images that have come in every year that kind of win. win. Um, these are artists and scientists judging this on campus, um, faculty and staff and deans are involved in this. Um, here's the tongue. I love this image because I had no idea the tongue is kind of have all these perpendicular orientations of cells. I just didn't know it looked like that gold melting, and then this is the hippocampus. And these are things that wouldn't make it into a journal, but they kind of, the reason why the, a lot of people will probably want to know what your tongue looks like, right? Your hippocampus, people kind of know, but it looks kind of like this space. It looks like a painting. It's not the most perfect image, but it's really beautiful, right? The colors that kind of come out of this. This is 2018. We've got blood vessels here, lots of color th theme, but the tungsten was the grand prize winner, if you could have Kind of pick, it's really amazing how how these um, compounds actually form and crystallize and these kind of things and then indium and cobalt together. Um, in 2019, again, different images come up. This is a corn grain. This is a barnacle that kind of looks like a watercolor. And then this one was our grand prize winner. And I, I want you to tell me what you think that looks like to you. What what artist? There's a famous painting you might know about. That stuff, Clint. <laughs> right? Right? So, so this is remarkable because you now have a rock that has that stuff, Clint, inside of it, right? So, for kids in the public, that's kind of an amazing little connection between um, known and unknown kind of things. So, it's just amazing what you kind of see in there. Um, here's another, this is one of Grand Prize winner on another year. You know, what is this? Do you have a guess what this is somewhere in your body? Any, anyone, what is, but what does it look like to you? What artist? Monet. Monet, yeah, Monet, right? Everyone, everyone kind of sees Monet. But this is the blood vessels of your eye. It's actually the cross, these are blood vessels here. And there's kind of like these, these, um, the cells in the eye, the omitidia are kind of here, but it looks like, you know, Monet. I mean, it's kind of a Crosby and Monet, Van Gogh-ish. It's even better than that in some ways. And when I do this for audiences and the young kids, the kids run away from my talk and will say, oh my gosh, there's a Monet in my eyeball, right? And I tell them that, yes, there are beautiful things in your own body that you have to discover, right? And that's the connection that you can really get young kids to go, I wanna go find those Monets in my eye, right? Like in my body or in the world, right? So all of this has kind of led to this kind of amazing public engagement where students are really excited about science coming away from this kind of talk. So that's the blood vessels in the eye. Um, when I became a faculty, people, students were coming to me from the art department 
um, I was in the art department. I wasn't able to train students yet, but a student, Chanel, came to me, who is a performance artist and does costume design. She had a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is a very big deal for art students. She came to my lab and spent time looking at the worm in the cuticle here. And she made fabric from this and did a whole performance um, from that. So Chanel kind of launched my, my mini foray into working with science and artists. She's still a, a if you look her up, she's still a performance artist. She's very successful at this. And she uses these, these fabrics that she designed in my lab still to this day. And a lot of her performances she does all over the world. Um, then my very first master of, she has an MFA, but she did her MA in my lab. Angela is a former high school art teacher and worked in museums. And she came to my lab uh, and she was a photographer by trade came to my lab in our floor and spent time on the second floor. And I thought, well, we have all these empty walls on the second floor. We, I, I, I installed the show on the first floor. So why don't we do this and put her artwork there? So she spent time doing this and she, her kind of background is kind of using, making new look old and all the, you know, kind of antiquing, you know, zebrafish development here. And she mounted it on wood. I, and it looks very scientific because it's kind of like a montage, but it's, it's just kind of there. So this is outside kind of my office. Um, and then talking about like the word translation, which is a science, but there's also people in art use the word translation all the time. So these kind of using these words that mean same and different things. Um, these are bacterial mandalas she made out of bacteria on our C. elegans E. coli plates. So we, she, she dumped pigments but the innovation here is how she's mounted it. I don't know if you recognize what's going on here. So I'm gonna zoom in. What's amazing is she used the microscope slide to mount her art. Right? So this is, I mean, so this is, I initially didn't even recognize it. It was so obvious to me, but it was kind of a cool, it was like a macro cover slide of showing these, the way you would display the art is through a science way. So it's kind of cool. So I want to show you in every art thing we do, we pay a student who is interested in documentary um, documentation to actually uh, see this. So we disseminate this further. So we always I always have students helping me and I train them how to do science communication here. So I'm going to show you two movies about this install and then the next install. This was our opening for this translation show and 150 people who had never stepped foot in a science building. And we told them, this is your building, your taxpayer money is going to this science, come in, right? But it was the art show, it was her science art show. So I'll just show you movies of that and then um, some of Angela's art. And it just has music here. So can you hear it a little bit? It's just the music. So these are the tracks of the C. elegans in this little cabinet. So the worms are crawling around inside the cabinet. So it, so it was a different way of looking at the worms instead of on the microscope, but through the keyhole. Pretty cool, huh? So that the outside of the wood she etched with, she she uh, traced the tracks of the C. elegans in their, on their uh, E. coli and then put it on the outside of that box and changed the way you view the worms through the keyhole in this cabinet kind of curiosity. So I'm gonna walk in now to using grants to do, so all of my NSF grants pay for my art um, uh, science collaborations. So I was approached by the biotech center to fill a 40 foot wall with the art. So this is enormous 
this is a huge commission for any artist. It's massive. Of course, this is not my full time job. So the goal here, we have an outreach program here is a bunch, bunch loads of kids come in, they learn about DNA and sequencing and all this stuff in this lab down here. So the goal was to try to get them involved in that. And so I wrote an NSF grant and they always have broader impacts part. And I, with my brother, I collaborated and came up with the concept because we worked with Angela is like, why don't we make like little kind of Petri dishes with, with kind of mirrors and we would etch and or silk screen the images on these things. So when you interacted, you kind of see yourself in the genome inside of you kind of thing. So this is the concept for the reflections. So I applied for this and I didn't really know you could put a budget in there. So NSF calls me and said, Anna, why don't you have a budget? I'm like, I didn't know how much you could put. I like no one mentored me to put, you know, because no one was doing so. So they called me and they said, well, if you put 50,000, we'll fund your science. So of course, this was a hard thing to do because our grants office usually, they usually have to take money away. So they were putting money in and on top of it, NSF gave me another 180,000 to do my science. So this art side and outreach has always been very, it's successful and helped my lab in a lot of ways. So this is not what it looked like because it turns out we didn't plan well how much weight this would cost and we would have to damage the wall. So we went through a lot of, Angela comes to our lab meetings. We had to figure out how do we not damage the wall, but do this concept. So we had to cut and circular glass and etching is a lot more expensive than square. So the concept is we had to map this out. So with any project you have to, in science and mapping out protocol, how are you gonna do this, right? So um, the, the, the idea here is that we're gonna have all the model organisms here with their 16S or 18S genome that are here in the model organism names here. And we have to actually put in some lighting. And so we went through lots of lab meetings um, test samples, lots of things. We lots of failed experiments, basically, just like you do in science. We had to mock it up like you would do an architect doing this. And we had to work with a lot of building people to do this. And so there was a lot of cost we didn't expect. Now I know how to do these kinds of things. And of course, we always have a, another, we have a new person doing, Matt Norman was our videographer who was getting his degree. So here's Matt and Angela looking at some of the kind of test prints of the the sand, so this is, we have a maker space in the engineering department. We collaborated with the engineers to, to figure out, we had to figure out exactly the distance and the font to get the effect we wanted. The goal here, which she came up with, we wanted to show complementary DNA with the light. And so the light would path and you would see the reflection of the complementary side. The way she did this was to just invert the sequences on, on the glass on top of a mirror. And so it'll, it'll be more clear to you. So here's a clear glass. This is what it looks like. So it's not what we thought it would look like, but this wood is reinforcing how heavy this glass and mirror is. And here's the model organisms here. And I'll show you how this looks up close. So um, what you're reading here, so we figured out the light path had to be exact angle. You're reading the reflection, right? So this is the kicker to the thing. The reflected stuff is what you're reading. And you'll see me here. So now there's a, you see the complementary strand here. It's actually complementary because it's the way we show the light. Um, and so it's very interactive. It looks much better in person because you see all the kids coming in, they see themselves. It's kind of like exciting to really watch um, them do it. And so I have a video of, we interviewed lots of people involved in this project, but I kind of cued it into the outreach people who are running this about how this has impacted the students who come by and interact with this. So an, another kind of short little two minutes version of this. Um, certainly good to talk about it later. The, the music's well, very low. important in this building in particular because it gives our visitors a chance to see ideas that otherwise they might not be able to see. So a lot of things in science you can't see visually with the naked eye. Like if you ask students to see DNA with the naked eye, they say no, but then here you are, you're literally walking by. So take something abstract and makes it concrete. I run with Tom Zinnin, the teaching lab. So we have K through 12 kids come in um, and we run workshops with them, specifically DNA based. We start them at the thought and we discuss that um, that macromolecule and the shape of it and how it runs. And then as we walk down the hall, we talk about those letters, and especially if you have like the little kids, they're like, wait a second, this is the four letters that we just talked about. And like some of them like literally like stop and they'll like 
he'll read <laughs> for 30 seconds or like read out loud all the letters and they're like huh so to make like that direct connection the, the fact that they can interact with it so closely i think is a really big deal with this other kid There's also cool things like reads if you don't have the light on, you can't really read the names of the model of the things. So they start getting the idea that lighting matters, not only in art, but in things like microscopy and how we try to see things in the life sciences as well as in the arts. So he kind of touched on this idea, like the light, we also had to pay for that lights, a lot of that, but these are things in the budgets when you're doing these and you don't know what you expect to do. But the idea that the light path to understand the students understand how you can see the reflection and you understand you can teach the kids polarization of light in a microscope and, and all of that stuff. Angela and myself ended up winning an innovation in, of the arts award in the whole city for this thing. It was so innovative because it was able to teach so many things in one piece. Um, and we spent obviously a long time trying to figure out how to do that and lots of experiments were involved in it. So, um, and the other part of it was was great is was that the physical plant people that often are not always involved in this kind of thing got super excited to be part of this project. And we actually ended up putting them in our acknowledgements things. So all of the building people and the glazers that do glass all the time and being kind of really inclusive in the process and making sure that you know, we don't just do this alone. There are a lot of people involved in helping us, engineers and artists, building people, and all of these other things are really important part of this kind of public piece. So I'm kind of really excited about this project and especially this idea of like having, we also have a traveling show too. And we make videos and we can, it's traveling. Um, it traveled to another university and, and we have other people interested in having doing it. Now with COVID thing kind of stopped down, but I have my lab, half of my lab has these big crates for moving this artwork around. So my lab also looks very odd compared to other people because I have all this artwork sitting around. We have an art area in my lab. So to disseminate this further, this is my background. We decided we were gonna make a website with that, but how do we disseminate this more broadly, but also give students a tangible takeaway possibly, right, from, from this piece. So to my two undergrads, Alif and Caitlin, both got six credits total, a whole year of in science, life science communication of trying to take that work and making an ABC coloring book. So Leaf did this beautiful color. You can get this book on Amazon and Blur, but I'll show you a couple pictures of it. So here's a Leaf and Caitlin. The Leaf wants to go to medical school. Caitlin wants to work for the CDC. They have different artistic styles and we try to have half of the alphabet be both of their styles. So being very inclusive to their own art and aesthetic. So this is um, Caitlin's kind of aesthetic. So this is a Arabidopsis for A and you'll kind of see, this is a leaf. So F is for fruit fly, but you can see a leaf's more, she has these kind of little motifs. I love this nucleus. So it's not really literally what it looks like, but kind of a cartoonish version of that. Um, coronavirus broke out. So we, we changed V from like vector to virus. So uh, obviously this page gets colored very much from a lot of our fans that we have. And more importantly, we get fans pictures with the books that came around. And so this is really what warms our heart and what we've done during coronavirus is actually have virtual. We have a whole thing on my website that has an interactive virtual. We have pages that the students can cover and we have YouTube videos of model, how model organisms are used in science. So we have them watch it before we meet them on Zoom. And we have them bring their colored page, but we also have them bring their actual page of art inspired by that. So we want them to show what do you observe in there and draw those pictures. So that's been a really great thing. And I bring, Leaf has attended with me and for a Leaf, for an undergrad, to get so excited about her color and art is impacting someone else. She'll take that for the rest of her life in a medical school and understand she's, she's remarkable and she understands that communication is really important with meeting with patients too, that different patients also are dyslexic like me or visual learner, all these people, you know, people you interact with every day learn in different ways. And so she took that away and it's been, I'm reading her personal statement from medical school. And those are kind of things she's, she's learned from this that I don't, you know, I wouldn't have recognized. I mean, I do know that's happening, but it was nice to see that she reflected on this experience doing this is impacted her with patience and communications further in her career. So that's kind of been great. Um, 
I'm, right at the sort of end here, I'm going to say, is this just me, right? You'll say, oh, it's Anna is just crazy creative and this is not. But I'll, I have some data on this. I just want to share at the end. Someone sent me this paper on Roots and Birdstein that says, did a lot of data analysis. Science, scientists, are, which are in red here, have hobbies in music and photography. So how many of you kind of have music and photography hobbies? I think a lot of, some people, well, a lot of photographers, I think, then the general population. And so it's kind of really interesting, right? Yeah, hi, Carl. So, but Nobel winners have hobbies in the arts and crafts more than the average scientist. So now the Nobel winners are in red. Look, look how it changes. Very interesting, right? And so where you have the general population and the Nobel winnings kind of like arts together. So that's kind of interesting. So your Nobel winners are coming from your general population, right? Of who like this kind of arts. It's, it's just being cognizant of this is actually happening. It's in music again, I, you know, and you see these people all the time. And compared to the scientists in general, award-winning scientists are more likely to have a hobbies in the arts. So this is, goes to show you, keep doing what you're doing. It's really important for how you see the world and your discoveries that you're made, right? Um, a lot of people ask me this question, what is about art that makes scientists more productive and successful? One example I'm showing you here is a genome assembly. It looks gorgeous, right? I don't even know exactly what it means, but it kind of looks beautiful. But this scientist decided this is how I'm going to do this and visualize it to tell people what's going on here. The connectiveness of the genome, for example. Some people have probably seen these kind of images. However, if I took the genome and I had the ability to do this, I would do it totally differently, right? You would do it totally differently. And, and so this is, the, this is why art makes scientists more productive is because this quote here I'll share from this metal urgent it says the richest aspects of any large complicated problem like the genome arise from factors that can't be measured. And this is where the artist's approach, uncertain though it, though it seems, finds and conveys more meaning. What he's telling you, and this is a very old quote, is that you, if you discover something in, in any kind of scientific project, you have to communicate it. And the way you communicate it is the way you're going to do it, right? And someone else would come by and communicate it totally differently. And that's why kind of data visualization is very popular now, this kind of thing. But People communicate science in different ways, and the better you do it, the better it gets communicated, more people like it and understand it. But equally, it also can be very beautiful. So there are a lot of things I've learned so far is that science can really inspire, engage the public, and finding things that you known and unknown is really important. Art is very easy to, to communicate a very complex idea. So this retina is kind of beautiful, but when you tell them that there's a Monet in your eyeball, this is kind of cool, right? Um, working with artists in my lab really inspires new ideas and coming up different ways of communicating science. In general, I've learned from my own life as scientists are actually very more creative people than I ever thought from when I was in my household of artists, right? So my own thoughts and stereotypes about what scientists were are has changed from this, right? And I'm a huge proponent um, of this idea of making sure that students get a well-rounded education in the arts and that science and arts is really, really important for innovation and communication of science. Um, and I found success, I'm being dyslexic, I hate math, but here's a Venn diagram that described me kind of perfectly. I found success in the overlap. You are gonna have your Venn diagram look different than mine. Where is your overlap? Where is your success in this integration of ideas and communication? Um, and lastly, I wanna say that my, a lot of my life has been involved about thinking that I'm different than myself, but this quote is great is that being able to see things differently doesn't make you crazy. It actually makes you really valuable to science and society, right? And so you may feel you're left out like me or too creative in this thing. It's not true at all. It's really a value to the whole scientific endeavor and public at, at large. And with that, I will take questions and thank you for listening and, and interacting with me. And uh, you can ask me anything. Wonderful. Um, yeah. I think there is some virtual claps there from everybody. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> thank scope. you, thank you. That was very insightful. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Shoot. I'll take, you can ask me whatever, any, any project you like, anything about my life, anything. Amanda, what do you have to say? <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like trying to find my mouse and hit the unmute button. 
Um, uh, I just, I just wanted to say, I, I absolutely loved every minute of this. I feel like I, I know you as a person as well as, as your work. So I, I love hearing stories about, about people's science experiences. That's part of my project for, for this. Um, but so I guess something that I was thinking about during your talk was all the moments in my own life where art and science have sort of connected and, and intersected and, um, I know as, as a kid, like in high school, I was um, trying to make study guides for, for studying for biology classes and anatomy classes. And my mom is an artist as well. So she um, had me make these like visual study guides that really helped me a lot as a visual learner to, to excel in those classes because of that connection with, with art. So I just, I just really love that. That was really meaningful for me well, to hear you your that. experience yeah, as well. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, so um, I guess my question for you is is how you, um, I guess in in graduate school, I'm in graduate school right now, how you incorporated art, um, just like the practice of art or, or into your PhD experience or just like the, the timing even of how you incorporate it into your daily life as a grad student. That's something that I want to do more of as well. So I started doing that art show. So I kind of only did that every year at the meeting. So I started doing it, but it was kind of like my third year to my last year at school. But I kind of, you know, I worked on early embryo development. So I kind of would draw everything. I still have my old notebooks. I kind of look at all my drawings, but I would kind of like map out like all my experiments that way visually. I, I realized that typing them out in a protocol was kind of hard for me to understand. So I kind of draw, you know, would draw, someone would draw the tube, oh, add this stuff, you know, it's kind of like, uh, like I just, the words are kind of jumbles for me. And so I would kind of write them out visually. So I kind of do, I did that. I did TA too. So I kind of come, came up with a ways of doing assessments by having students draw and visualize things and, and bring, making sure they understood that observation is really important and seeing and writing those things down to you understand those things. So um, yeah, always in the classroom. I do that in my classroom now today. My class is completely flipped classroom. I have the students do uh, their talks. We use BioRender now in class and they visualize. I teach them how to write a grant. This is undergrads now by visualizing in a talk and using BioRender to do that. Their writing gets better. And I find students that are dyslexic like myself like this technique. So I write grants by doing talks like I'm a much better speaker and visualizer. So I, every slide that I give, I put my science up there. So if you see one of my science talks, those are about two to three sentences in my grant. And I can formulate the order visually, but I can't do it on, on paper. So I, when I have a stumble, stumbling block in my writing, I use those together and I teach them students now how to do that technique because students can't sometimes self critique themselves on paper. So when they, I go, well, just visualize it. And they go, well, there's a missing, slide here I go exactly there's a missing sentence right so so that's I've done that from my grad school to try to help the students I'm TAing but also to help myself communicate stuff certainly I would spend I spent months in the old days I had to make a VHS tape of embryos develop and I went I would spend I had to give a talk at a meeting and I spent months and had a VHS tape and had to play a movie but it was like people remember it till this day because it was like a Hollywood production but it was just something I spent. Now you can do this easily, you know, in keynote and, and stuff. So I really spend a lot of time doing the communication of science and it paid off. I give talks constantly. My very first talk was like, I think as a grad student, it was 8,000 people at ASCB. I, I was terrified and I had a VHS tape. But after that, people, they'll, once you do one of these and you do it well and people go, well, this is kind of cool. It just continues. And so I do spend a lot of time doing that, but it helps me write and get over my own stumbling blocks. So anyway, that's, it's a kind of a long winded, but my whole life's kind of in, in intertwine of how do I learn to write better and use art to visualize and help me get over those stumbling blocks and help other students find those things too. Um, and I guess, I mean, I guess other things I did as a, a grad student too is um, because my mom's, my mom's mother is, is, is Cherokee um, and really grew up in a traumatic home and ran away from home is that I spent a lot of time talking to her and understanding um, the issues of indigenous in this country. And so I done a lot of outreach and I started um, tutoring students um, who are, who are, no, I neighbor, but, uh, you know, BIPOC students at that time 
in my free time um, because it was really important to me. I was a McNair scholar myself. I have a low income student. You know, I have a disability too. I have invisible disabilities too. So, so I've always done that in the side and art always comes into play there, but also telling my own personal story is very helpful for those students to see themselves in you and do that path. And so um, a lot of people didn't know I was doing it, but I did it because someone gave me a chance, right? Someone gave me, you know, federal government gave me work study money. I was able to do this. And so I always have given back stuff. Um, so I guess balancing your time in grad school, doing that, um, it, those are how I incorporate in my daily life. I did do ceramics. I went to studios. I learned to glass blow. I learned to make cakes. You know, I did a lot of stuff. I mean, some people are runners. A lot of people are runners in science or super athletic. I kind of like, I'll make jewelry. I make cakes. I do a lot. You know, it's just different. And so for me, my outlook, my my the stuff I do in my free time is more artsy in that. So it keeps me sane doing those things. And I'm heavily involved in the art community, but it's because it's who I am. Right. And so it's different than other people. I just I can't run. I have a disability, so I have to do something else. And this is just what I do. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, you have to hit all your right. Yeah, no, that's really wonderful. I love the the idea of drawing out um, what you're writing in your grant. I feel like that's something that's going to help me in in writing grants as well. Um, another yeah. thing, if if I can ask another question yeah. um, that that I was thinking about, um, especially with the genetic reflections project, is thinking about um, STEM identity, which is a concept that I'm uh, yeah. working into my project as well but how uh, how people see themselves in relationship to science. And um, my project is looking at how to train scientists to tell personal stories about, um, about their experiences in STEM. But yep. I was also thinking of a artistic element um, to it maybe at some point in the future, um, but having scientists create art themselves about their experiences as well, I feel like would be a really interesting way to, to see how they see themselves reflected in, yeah. in too. No, I, lo I love that idea. I, I guess I'll give you a hint. There was a there was a, a long time. I still can't find this paper, but I knew it was there. They asked Nobel winners to draw what their science means to them. It's out there. I think you could probably find it. I love that. I thought that was a cool project. My new my new triple A my if then ambassador project. I'm putting it in the chat. So I'm doing something It's different than that, but it's called Lab Culture Recipes. It's a food blog about scientists. So there's over 100 scientists who have their favorite food and their recipes on there. So you could check that out. Yeah. The idea is to talk about cultural identity in science and mm -hmm. to see people and to share recipes. And I would like to have lab culture dinners with scientists and young kids and their parents. So that's my goal. I would love to have a TV show like this. This is <laughs> kind of like my idea. But this kind of idea, I love this idea. But I think the hard, I'll tell you my own experience with this project that's now on we're, we're, we have a lot of scientists, but you can see there's not that many recipes. That hurdle is trying to get the scientists to do what you want them to do. So you really, it is even as much of some of these people are my good friends and they have big Twitter kind of followers or whatever, you can't get them to submit a recipe, even though I know they cook all the time. It's like, oh, I forgot. But the If the Ambassadors who are with me have kind of, I they're doing it because the If Them program is tweeting us out. So it is hard to do it. And so you have to start small and don't imagine everyone's going to do it. And so um, some people will, but it will take them a long time. So we, we released this website in, in kind of late January and we got over a hundred scientists because the profile is kind of easy, but the recipe is harder to do to get them to do it. Um, but we have a lot, we're doing the spotlights on here. We want the scientists to show pictures of their either having a dinner with their family and to show what their family life looks like at a meal or with their parents or whatever, or with their lab too. And look how multicultural the lab is. And so that's the concept. The if then loves this idea. And it, cause it's, it's, and, and for me, the idea is to really say, Hey, we're all, we're, we're scientists are just like me, you know, mm -hmm. Oh, there's scientists in Puerto Rico. There's science in Pakistan. I mean, it's awesome. Scientists are everywhere, right? Like that's really important for young kids to see that. And so I think for me as a foodie, my my first foray into understanding how multicultural science was like being in a lab overwhelmed me because I never was on a plane until after kind of undergrad because I never was I, I never thought I could travel the world because my family didn't have money but I realized when I got to a lab how multicultural it was that we I was having foods from all over the world and so that was kind of 
I wanted to capture that with this meal thing. Um, and when I have dinners with scientists, when they come, I, I love that taking them after their talk to have dinner. That is, those are my favorite times of science. And it's, I love those times. I, I, I love to host people. I love because I want to find out who those, re, those they really are. Right. And we talk about art and science, but yeah, I, I would love to, I support you all the way to do this, but just be going there with the idea that you're going to get <laughs> not as much as you think you will. You can have an event, for example, where you have them do it right in front of you and just tell them you're going to do it. That is easier than having them submit something. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's it's a great idea. I'm, I'm such a foodie too, so I'm definitely excited to check that out. Well, check it out. Yeah, you that's know, wonderful. any any ideas you have are happy, and you can also submit your own profile and recipe. I would love for all of you to be participate. It's all open to everyone. We just got like try to get as much big Twitter heavy hitters on on here to kind of promote it. So there's a lot of big scientists on there, but I don't have everyone, but I, we want everyone to be involved in it. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Scope. This was wonderful. We learned so much. I think yeah. Yeah, we, need to, we need you to come back at some point. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I mean, Carlo, um, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, we have another two minutes left. Um, yeah. Maybe one more question. Anyone else have a question, comment? Liana, um. you look like, I was going to say, I had a question, um, if you can answer in, in two minutes, um, but something you said really resonated with me, which is that a lot of us, I think, kind of, for lack of a better phrase, um, have the creativity sort of beat out of them by the public school system and the science system, um, and that really resonates with me personally. So what advice would you have to people who feel like they've lost their creativity or can't find it again? I mean, start doing it and get an Instagram page and kind of put it up there and see what what happens. I mean, I think you have to just start. I I mean, I love Instagram for that because very visual. You don't have to write it. You don't have to feel nervous about writing it and having your, you know, like, like Twitter is a little more scarier for that, but there's no visual content there. Um, start an Etsy store, right? So a lot of scientists have a little Etsy store. Start small. But I think for me is when I started even my food blog, my own food blog, not this lab culture, you start to see how many people really like your idea and like what you're doing. And this is worldwide, right? And that's enormous. And so that gives me confidence for my own self because I, I'm not judged, so Bri, I'm not judged by all of this stuff. No one in my department cares about this, right? So that takes a personal you know, that's a personal hit to my own <laughs> ego is that what I'm doing is of no value to the academic system in terms of that. They now understand it, but I'm not judged that way. I'm judged on my papers. I'm judged on my science talks like that. So the only way to kind of feel this way is one, to talk to public like this, to give you a public talk like this. This brings me, you know, lots of love and good feelings in me. But when you start to put your art or the things you're really interested in out there, if you're willing to do that, you will feel that you'll be like, wow, all these other people doing science really love what I'm doing too. And I'm really of value. So for me, social media has changed my feeling about science. And I found so many other science artists there who also feel the same way. And so there's a community of people to help you there and to be part of. So I would just, if you're willing to do that, or you could just do your own art or do this and kind of share it with your own local group. It depends on how you feel, but I feel that's one mechanism that has made me feel better about that there is a value to what I'm doing here. Does that make sense? But it, it's, it's a long road. I can't tell you my life has been easy because I'm not judged for this at all, right? It doesn't go into my 10 year packet. It doesn't, even though it's on my grants, it doesn't go into anywhere. It just goes into who it's Anna's brand, right? Anna's brand is doing science art stuff. It's been my thing, but I also do science and I have a lab and this kind of thing. So I have two sides of myself, but I'm fulfilled because I do those things. I do get credit training the art students in my lab, but I do, I do get credit for doing that for teaching, right? So um, I find ways to get credit for those things secretly. <laughs> for, you know, doing at least a, a, that thing. But it, it's still, I'm not teaching a 100 class full of students doing science art yet. I will eventually, but I'm not there yet. That's so. wonderful. And that, that gives me inspiration to, you know, yeah. say I in terms of creating that sandbox space for individuals like yourself to create a space that they can do that, you know, teaching research yeah. in this space. 
yeah. get credit, get support. Um, yeah. It's a work in progress for sure. But thank you so much for the inspiration. Um, yeah. And as I said, we need you to come back soon enough. Um, yeah, and- you know, <laughs> Bree, happy to talk to you offline. Are there any other ideas you have? Happy to chat. You, I'm only on a scope in the world. You can email me, <laughs> hook up with me on social media. I'd love to follow what you're doing. I'd love to see your projects and all that stuff. I'm very excited you're into public engagement. So this is a wonderful thing. Wonderful. Right. Yeah, right, thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye.